Hey everyone, welcome to my talk today on how to do code review the offensive security way. So the first thing that you need to do when you're doing code review is obtaining the source code. This can often prove difficult because of some source code, some source code being restricted behind a sales process or just being generally difficult to get your hands on. So one of the first techniques that I want to get into is obtaining the source code through cloud marketplaces. These days, we're fortunate enough to have many vendors list their software on cloud marketplaces like AWS, Azure, and GCP. In many cases, trial licenses are available, which lets us access software that would typically be gated by an enterprise sales process. Um, so this is pretty valuable because we can leverage these marketplace offerings to obtain the source code for enterprise software. Personally, I have used cloud marketplaces to gain access to source code multiple times where it's typically behind some sort of sales process or is really difficult to get access to. So here's an example. Um, there was this piece of software called Teradisi PCOIP Manager, um, and it was something that Facebook were running. So you can see in this screenshot, um, there's a subdomain under fb.com where I identified that they were running PCOIP Connection Manager. Now, typically, it's not so easy to get access to this source code um, or this software. What I found was it was available on AWS's marketplace, like you can see in the screenshot below. What this let me do was simply spin up an instance of Teradisi PCOIP Manager on AWS's marketplace and then obtain the source code to do source code analysis. Another method of obtaining the source code is container image registries. So similar to cloud marketplaces, you'd be surprised at some of the enterprise software which you can find pre-built Docker con containers for, images for. So if you go to hub.docker.com and you search for the software that you're interested in reverse engineering, you'll often find something that is already on Docker Hub and can be used to reverse engineer the software. Um, if there's an image available, you can simply spin up a Docker container using that image and gain shell access to that container. Then you can obtain all of the source code once you're inside the container, whether that's WAR files, JAR files, or PHP files for further analysis. So this technique I've been pretty successful with as well. I've often found that there's enterprise software that typically requires a license that's pre-built um, as a Docker image and posted on Docker Hub. Um, this is something that often you will find on Docker Hub because of you know whatever reason someone is trying to do DevOps for their company and they've pushed these images to Docker Hub for convenience. But ultimately, it's useful because you don't need to be able to get the, a copy of that software or even spin up the infrastructure. You can simply pull down the Docker image and start up a Docker container containing that software. So here's a little meme around Docker Hub. You can see that um, in the first window, there's uh, Adobe Experience Manager. You can contact sales to get access to the software. But alternatively, you can just get it on Docker Hub. There's a container for Adobe Experience Manager that was updated only two months ago on Docker Hub. So sometimes you can really defeat the whole sales process and the whole gated software approach where it's possible to get access to the software without going through a sales process through something like Docker Hub. Another unfortunate way of getting uh, access to source code is actually contacting sales. Now this is one of the more high friction, high reward approaches because typically contacting sales is not something that is an enjoyable experience from my experience. And often it is a long lengthy process where you need to explain to them why you want the software and why you are someone they should consider to give a trial or something like that. So if the only possible way is to get access to the software by contacting sales, um, this might still be a viable solution. Um, it also means that if that's the only way to get access to the software, that it probably hasn't had many people looking at the software's source code in the past due to how difficult it is to get. Um, while this option is the high, has the highest friction involved, if you can convince sales to give you a trial copy of the software, it's pretty likely that you're going to be able to own the crap out of it. This is my least favorite route of getting access to the software because who really wants to talk to sales? But historically speaking, this has had the highest rewards when it comes to finding critical vulnerabilities. Another approach to obtaining the software is through freelancing websites. So um, this is an example where I went on Fiverr.com and I asked someone on Fiverr if they had experience with a software called WebSphere Commerce. 
I asked them, I said, do you have experience with this? Do you have access to the installation files so that and can download them? If you can, I'd be, I'd be happy to pay you to install them on a server and upload the files for me. This is surprising, surprisingly a pretty effective technique because there are a lot of professionals on Fiverr, on Freelancer and other freelancing websites that have access to software that you typically don't. They often have credentials for IBM or for VMware or whatever website that has a gated download process. So you can often go to these um, freelancing websites and ask someone or pay someone to install a piece of software that's typically difficult to get. Um, so you can see that this ad was related to someone offering to install software related to WebSphere, Tomcat, JBoss, Wildfly. And I just asked them, I said, hey, do you have access to a copy of WebSphere Commerce? I'd be interested in buying that off you. So this is another approach you can take to obtaining software. Another technique is obtaining source code through GitHub. Now, GitHub has a way of searching for files that's pretty effective. So if you've identified a unique file name in your software, like for example here that we've got install CMS step onespx then on GitHub, I could search file name and that file name to see if there are any hits. And this can be pretty effective when you're looking for .NET or Java code bases because you can often find the JAR files or the ASPX files and the DLL files for the software that you're looking for. Um, a lot of people post their entire web route on GitHub for some reason. A lot of people post a lot of sensitive information and software on GitHub. So this is a really good, uh, really good way of discovering software that you typically don't get, don't have access to. And lastly, one other way of obtaining software is chaining vulnerabilities. So when you can leverage other vulnerabilities to obtain so the source code for the application, some of the challenges include not knowing all of the local file locations of the source code. And sometimes this isn't something that's allowed by vendor or bug bounty programs. Um, often local file disclosure is one of the easiest ways to, for an attacker to read the source code from underlying systems. Um, external entity injection can also lead to local file disclosure, and this is potentially another way to read the source code. And obviously, remote command execution will let you read the source code and execute as you can execute arbitrary commands. On .NET systems particularly, you can download the DLL files from the bin folder and then decompile them to C Sharp source code. There are some good blog posts on the internet about how you can do this and how you can uh, essentially enumerate the DLL files that you need to download. So now that we've talked a little bit about obtaining the software, um, one of the other things that I want to go through is some of the source code analysis that needs to be done on the server side in order to discover vulnerabilities. Now remember this entire presentation is about um, source code analysis in an offensive security way. What I find really difficult with approaching targets from a completely black box perspective is number one, you don't have access to the source code. So that should have been addressed by the first section of this presentation. Now in this section of the presentation, I wanna go through a little bit about what sort of vulnerabilities you can look for and what, what the result of source code analysis can look like when you are successful. So here's an example from Teradisi PCO IP Manager. Um, this was a vulnerability that I submitted to Facebook uh, a couple of years ago. Um, can you spot the vulnerability in this snippet of code? Well, the vulnerability actually lies where it says random.nextbytes. Um, in this section, what it's actually doing is it's using java.util.random. And that is essentially an insecure random function in Java. This means that an attacker can potentially crack the seed and then predict future sessions that are being made on Teradisi PCO IP Manager. This wouldn't have been super obvious to you if you just looked at this source code and didn't have much knowledge about Java or how random uh, how the random util works in Java, but this is why it's really important to have a good base understanding of each programming language you are attempting to audit because there are gonna be vulnerabilities that are nuanced and require a little bit more attention in order to discover. So as, as I said earlier, this is insecure randomness. The sessions were generated by java.util.random instead of secure random. Due to this, the sessions have an incredibly weak seed that can be determined, allowing the attacker to predict future seeds, future session IDs. This can be of critical impact because attackers can generate valid future sessions by knowing the seed value. Facebook paid $4,000 for this vulnerability in 2018. 
Here's another example from Teradisi PCO IP Manager. Um, you can see in this servlet, it is uh, accepting a post request. And as a part of the post request, it's parsing some XML. Um, you can see that it tries to sanitize the XML. However, ultimately, um, it gets parsed by parse XML input. The parse XML input function essentially creates a document and parses the XML um, without any other modifications. If you can spot the vulnerability here, essentially, it's not the presence of something that indicates the vulnerability, it's actually the lack of something that indicates the vulnerability. Typically, when you parse XML in Java, uh, and when you have a document that you use a document builder for, or SAX, or something like that to parse the XML, you need to explicitly specify not to expand entities, and explicitly specify that DTDs are not allowed. In this case, that hasn't happened. And essentially what's happening is the XML is being parsed directly without any modifications or settings or configuration items, and it leads to external entity injection. So this is what the POC looks like. Essentially you post to a specific endpoint, and then you include an XML input that contains your DTD that this will ultimately exploit. Um, the, when the XML is parsed, it will reach out to your DTD and then once that uh, is done, it will then e evaluate your DTD's contents. This leads to things like local file disclosure and server-side request forgery. So no protections were in place within the source code to protect from external ex entity expansion. Through the FTP server trick, it was possible to obtain the full contents of files from, this, from the file system, and directory listing was possible as well. Um, Teradisi PCO IP Manager was, uh, was and still is hosted on Facebook's infrastructure. This particular bug led to a bounty of $5,500. Another bug that I want to quickly go through today is an employee management system zero day. I can't really disclose the vendor as I've reported the bug to their bug bounty and it's not allowed to disclose who they are. However, they produce a software that a lot of companies use to manage pay slips and other employee related data. This source code was obtained through a friend of mine, however, it's definitely not something that was easily obtainable on the internet. I discovered an XSS zero day through XML injection. Unfortunately, I could not escalate it to XXE. So here's the example of source code which I was looking at, and you can see that it essentially takes in a few parameters and passes it to the system tree command function. When the system tree command function is uh, initialized, it uses these parameters that it took in, in the first snippet of code, and it replaces a bunch of XML on the local file system before evaluate, before returning the XML to the user. You can see that the Delphi GUID is a user input from the previous piece of code that I showed. And over here, you can see that in the XML, it replaces a variable in the XML with the contents of the user input Delphi GUID. So what you could do is essentially provide a Delphi GUID that injects a C data um, XML element, which contains arbitrary HTML. Now the reason this works is because the content type returned by this endpoint is text slash HTML. So that's why this XSS vulnerability works. You can inject a Delphi GUID, which has C data XML element, and ultimately that C data XML element is evaluated as text slash HTML, leading to cross-site scripting. This was reflected cross-site scripting. So lastly, I just wanna leave uh, some tips for code reviewers. Now, in the previous section, I just showed you some examples of what code review looks like and what you can discover through source code analysis. Um, these are examples of source code analysis through the offensive security lens. Um, often I didn't have access to the source code, I had to figure out a way to get access to the source code, and ultimately I always ultimately discovered vulnerabilities within the things that I was looking at after spending a bunch of time on it. So before I wrap up this presentation, I just want to give a few tips for people who are getting into source code review and people who may be a bit more experienced with source code review. For novice code reviewers, so beginners, um, what I suggest is you identify all the sources and sinks. The sources are where data is being input and the sinks are where data ends up being processed. 
Um, spend time doing recon on the code base. So for example, identifying all the routes. So the web.xml file, the application.xml file, the routes.rb file, depending on what language it is, there's gonna be a different way to define the different routes and controllers for the application. I suggest that you discover these and you go through them in, in depth and you understand how the sources and syncs work. Next, I would map out these routes to the server-side functionality and make a note of all the inputs for each of these routes. Be thorough with it, it's totally worth it. If you can understand where all the user input is coming from and where it is going, that is gonna help you in your vulnerability discovery process and your source code analysis process. And lastly, go through a server-side flow from a HTTP request from the source to, point, to the point in code where it's being processed, the sync. Repeat this process for all the other places in the attack surface, for all other attack surface. So these are some of the tips that I would like to provide to beginner code reviewers. And I think these are practical tips that they can employ in order to become better at code review. Ultimately, code review is really based on experience and it's based on the ability to understand how a programming language works, but also how the code base works. And each code base is different. Um, in this presentation, I, what I can't really tell you is how to become a really great source code reviewer I can just give you tips on how to become more experienced at source code review, which will ultimately lead to you being able to discover more vulnerabilities when you do source code review. And my biggest takeaway when it comes to source code review is the more time you spend reviewing different code bases, more patterns become familiar to you. And you can start understanding how people structure their code bases and how certain things operate like controllers and views and models and things like that on different applications. Often applications are completely different to each other. Every time you approach a new code base, it's completely different. So what really helps is having the experience of doing source code review in the past on previous code bases that helps in the future. For more experienced code reviewers, what I would suggest is to understand the interoperation within the software and to make sure that you map out the potential attack surface thoroughly. Reviewing all the dependencies that are being used is also really important because you can audit these dependencies for security issues and you can take the concepts of syncs even further. Sometimes you have to get your hands dirty and fuzz binaries. Like for example, there's been vulnerabilities in binaries like image, image magic, and that's just a dependency of a product. So sometimes you have to go deeper than just what the initial source code is. If it's depending on certain things like image magic or exif tool, for example, then you might need to start auditing some of those binaries as well if you wanna try and find vulnerabilities within those syncs. Um, another thing is not to make assumptions, even for standard libraries. So always read the documentation and code to fully understand how the functionality is being provided. And sometimes, even if it's a standard library, read through the source code of that standard library function so you can understand exactly how it's operating. Sometimes this will shock you and you will find there's some behavior that you didn't, that was not something you expected even in the standard library. Another thing is ensuring that you're covering all attack surface, so all internally and externally exposed ports, protocols, and services when considering attack chains. So what do I mean by this? Essentially, let's say you had a target that um, you were doing some source code review for and there was a Redis server and Redis was being used. Then you need to also consider all of the possible attack vectors that involve the Redis server as well when you do all of your source code analysis. So understand the interoperation between the different services and internally, externally exposed ports and protocols when you're doing your source code analysis. And lastly, make an effort towards chaining the vulnerabilities for impact. So if there's a whitelist for an SSRF, do not stop there. Attempt to exploit this whitelist uh, for things like open redirects to achieve an unbounded SSRF. So this is something that I often do when I do source code analysis. I find vulnerabilities that they, they think they're protected against the vulnerability class, but under closer analysis and deeper inspection, you find that you can bypass the protections they have put in place. And lastly, gain a deep understanding about the application and its stack by reading the documentation thoroughly. I cannot stress how important this is. Each framework and each application can have its quirks and can be different. Sometimes by understanding these nuances within these applications and frameworks, you will find really good vulnerabilities due to those nuances. So that's all, um, that's all I have today, but I really appreciate you taking the time to watch my presentation. Um, Thanks so much for coming.